Muy buenas tardes o buenas noches, donde quiera que se encuentren, a todos y a todas. Gracias por unirse a este Afternoon Tertulia del Centro de Estudios Puertorriqueños. Mi nombre es Ángel Antonio Ruiz, soy el director asociado de Arte y Cultura para el Centro de Estudios Puertorriqueños. A nombre de la familia de Centro y de nuestra directora interina, Yarimar Bonilla, les damos la bienvenida. En el día de hoy, eh, este evento forma parte de la serie de eventos que hemos tenido todos los martes durante el mes de noviembre, que es el mes de la herencia puertorriqueña en los Estados Unidos. Eh, y este evento forma parte de una serie que se llama Borimix. Borimix es un evento que se coordina a través de eh, el Clemente Soto Vélez, el Centro Cultural eh, y Educativo Clemente Soto Vélez en el Lower East Side, eh, lo coordina también Teatro SEA y Teatro LATEA. Esta es la tercera de cuatro, eh, de cuatro conversaciones que hemos estado teniendo sobre el tema de San Juan, eh, dado que se, se enmarca y se celebra en este año los 500 años de fundación de nuestra ciudad capital. Eh, para hablar un poco más a fondo sobre esto, en el día de hoy decidimos tener una conversación no solo que se enmarque en eh, Viejo San Juan, sino pensar la ciudad como una ciudad que sucede a ambos lados de la muralla. Para eso eh, tenemos un, un eh, grupo muy de lujo de invitados eh, y de invitadas eh, que son convocados a través de la Oficina Estatal de Conservación Histórica de Puerto Rico, que se encuentra en Vallaja. Eh, aprovechamos la oportunidad para agradecer a su director, al arquitecto Carlos Rubio, ¿verdad? Por, por apoyar esta iniciativa, y a Liria Lara, quien también va a ser una de nuestras panelistas, por eh, definitivamente ayudar a que este encuentro fuera una realidad. Eh, los cuatro panelistas que tenemos en el día de hoy, voy a dar una biografía muy mínima, pero la biografía la tenemos como parte de, de, de los de las notas al, al programa, eh, comenzamos con la doctora Arlene Pavón. La doctora Arlene Pavón eh, ha escrito varios libros específicamente sobre arquitectura, una decena de artículos importantísimos eh, y ha sido en más de una ocasión, eh, en dos ocasiones de hecho, la directora como tal o el oficial eh, de preservación histórica de Puerto Rico. Tenemos también a José Marul del Río, quien es el historiador senior eh, de la institución. Colaboró con San Juan Blanco y Negro desde 1995 hasta 2015. Parte de esos estudios eh, resultaron en dos exhibiciones eh, que están ahora mismo en, en, en muestra en el Museo de la Historia de San Juan. Eh, también tenemos a la doctora Lilian Lara. Lilian eh, ha coordinado cerca de cuatro volúmenes de la revista Patrimonio. Eh, es estudiosa del arte puertorriqueño y también ha dirigido programas educativos eh, en las artes. Eh, y por último, a la doctora Silvia Álvarez Curbelo, historiadora, comunicadora, profesora de comunicaciones, miembro de la Academia de Historia puertorriqueña y quien ha publicado varios libros de historias, entre ellos eh, el de la historia de la Universidad de Puerto Rico. Eh, esos son nuestros panelistas. Una vez ellos terminen su presentación, vamos a tener una sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Si van a la plataforma de Zoom, a la parte de abajo, van a ver un pequeño icono para preguntas y respuestas que los panelistas van a, van a poder estar viendo. El panel va a ocurrir, eh, algunos panelistas van a hablar en español, otros van a hablar en inglés. No se preocupen porque va a haber eh, traducción simultánea. Entonces, sin más, los dejo con el inicio de la presentación. Eh, entiendo que empieza la doctora Arlene Távila, ¿correcto? ¿No? ¿Empieza Marul? Marul, no la escuchamos, está en mute. Okay, now. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm Jose Marul del Rio, and I worked in the Puerto Rico State Historic Preservation Office for 30 years 
first a state historian and after 2000, a senior historic property specialist. On behalf of the architect, Carlos A. Rubio Cancela, State Historic Preservation Officer, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the viewers, participants, and invited speakers who will participate to the, in tonight's forum, San Juan, Una Ciudad a Ambos Lados de la Muralla. At PR Shippo, we have received the invitation of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, Hunter College, and within the framework of what he makes festival with gratitude. Definitely this virtual forum is unique opportunity to share the results of our different documentation education efforts relating to the built heritage of the San Juan Islet and how this has helped local efforts to celebrate the 500th year since the foundation of the city of San Juan de Puerto Rico. Not moving. Sorry. Technical problems. Okay. Okay. The forum's title is related to the current understanding that Old San Juan and its wards beyond were historically stood the walls should be viewed as one. The separation of the wall city from the exterior wards, Puntilla, Marina, and Puerta de Tierra is an outmoded artificial construct used in the past when writing the history of San Juan. The exterior wards are an integral part of the city for the urban projects as Paseo de Covadonga, as wharfs for the products brought by ship to the port, and for the defensive purposes, the three defensive lines, and as an area for cow raising or for land for future city expansion. But before proceeding to the presentation, it is necessary to take a moment to discuss in broad strokes what is the Puerto Rico Historic Preservation Office, its mission, and what does it do? The National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 as amended, established the State Historic Preservation Offices in the United States and US, depend US dependencies, including Puerto Rico. Located on the third floor of the majestic historic Bayaha Infantry Barracks, facing the Motor Castle Esplanade in Old San Juan. The Peru Shippo's mission is to improve the understanding among all the citizenry in Puerto Rico of our historic properties, cultural value, and their use as a powerful tool to promote economic development, to protect the environment, and to enhance the quality of life. Our office, in contrast to local agencies like the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, is tasked with implementing a federal preservation program island-wide that involves providing technical assistance to the public and private groups in conservation efforts, preparing historic conservation plan for Puerto Rico, commenting on construction projects funded or that require permits or licenses from federal agencies to deal with possible adverse effects on historic properties, and maintain historic inventory and nominate eligible properties to the National Register of Historic Places. I have concluded this brief introduction and would like to welcome Dr. Lillian Lara Fonseca, Pierre Shippo's educational coordinator, who will be speaking on Puerto's efforts to commemorate the 500 years of the founding of San Juan. Thank you. Good evening to all. It is my pleasure to address you directly from the State Historic Preservation Office 
located at Vallaja Barracks in Old San Juan. As Education Coordinator on Historic Preservation at PR Chico, I greatly appreciate the invitation from Center for Puerto Rican Studies of Hunter College to participate with admired colleagues on this forum, San Juan, a city on both sides of the wall. In the past decades, PR Chico has committed to provide information and educate our citizens as established by one of the provisions of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 as amended. In this sense, it should be highlight, highlighted that PR Chico has advised and in different instances has been involved in guiding the discussion about the commemoration of the 500 years of the founding of San Juan. The agency's outreach efforts even precede the commemorative period of the founding of the historic enclave. Particularly since the 1990s, PR Shippo focused on subsiding studies and nominations of districts of the San Juan Islet and then being a persistent voice in disseminating the relevance of celebrating its history. Since the mid of 2017, I represented PR Shippo on diverse encounters related to the commemoration of the fifth centenary of the founding of San Juan. I was integrated to this relevant initiative by State History Preservation Officer Architect Carlos Arrubio Cancela with the mandate to gather representatives of all educational and cultural entities located at Vallaja Sector to initiate efforts to foment a profound discussion about the historic islet that include not only Old San Juan, but also Puerta de Tierra District. From 2017 to 2018, I coordinated three important meetings that took place in Vallaja Barracks. Without question, this was the tips of the spare for an important dialogue about all the dissemination initiatives that could be considered to commemorate the historic event. In this encounter, we had the representation of the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, the Puerto Rican Foundation of, for the Humanities, the Puerto Rican Academy of the Spanish Language, the School of Fine Arts and Design of Puerto Rico, the League of Arts Students, the Center for Advanced Student Studies of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, the Museum of the Americas, the Puerto Rican Academy of History, and the All San Juan History Association. This important convening of PR Shippo with other entities provoked that in September 2018, former Governor Ricardo Rosselló stopped his signature on the Executive Order number 2018 to create the Special Commission for the celebration of 500 years of the foundation of the city of San Juan. This administrative law designated the members of the commission which, which included representatives of government agencies and of cultural and educational entities located in Ombayaja neighborhood and established the commemorative period of the commemoration beginning on September 12, 2019 and finalizing on December 30, 2021. Recently, this executive order was amended by Governor Pedro Pierluis Urrutia delegating all the events related to the commemoration to the San Juan Municipality and its mayor, Miguel Romero Lugo. Now the festivities have extended till summer 2022 until an expected regatta. Besides all the events that the municipal government has linked to celebrate the historic city, Vallaja cultural entities have completed a variety of outreach projects in the commemorative period. Specifically, since 2017, PR Shippo began to take the right steps to complete the publication of two books and a commemorative volume of its official magazine, Patrimonio. In addition, sponsored the publication, Vivir en Puerto Rico en el siglo XVI, from Dr. Luis Burset, and collaborate to achieve the assembly of an art exhibition in the city museum based on one of the publications. All of these efforts will be presented briefly tonight. Jose Marul del Rio will offer an outline of his work as author of the book Protegiendo la Capital Desarrollo Histórico de las Obras Defensivas en Puerta de Tierra, published in 2019. 
Also, I will discuss puntual approaches addressing the book, La Ciudad en el Tiempo, Cinco Siglos de Representaciones Artísticas de San Juan, published in 2020. In 2020. Text I had the opportunity to edit with Dr. Lisette Cabrera Salcedo. La Ciudad en el Tiempo had the collaboration of, of various art historians who wrote the chapters that will be mentioned and seated before long. It is important to mention that Pierre Shippo has distrib distributed both books free of charge with the purpose of reaching all sectors and democratizing the important inventory of maps, illustrations, and works of art that were compiled, as well as to disseminate the interesting approaches addressed by the scholars who wrote for these publications. On the other hand, PR Shippa will be presenting soon its commemorative volume of Patrimonio Tairo, Aquia de Ser la Ciudad, that had Dr. Silvia Álvarez Pulvero as monograph coordinator. Tonight, we will have a preview of how she conceptualized the volume and the contributions of the specialists that collaborated with articles for the commemorative piece. But first of all, we will have the participation of Dr. Arlene Paul Charneco. She will guide us in understanding important aspects about the nominations that she generated for all San Juan and Puerto de Tierra districts about, uh, included on the National Register of Historic Places, as well as the nomination of all San Juan to the National Historic Landmark. Arlene has always been involved in projects with PR Shippo as a result of her research, research effort, the agency was able to include both sectors of the ELET as historic districts on the federal list. This is an important accomplishment that has to be a part of the discussion in this forum. Without further ado, I give the word to Dr. Arlene Pavon Charneco. Thank you, Lillian. Buenas noches. Good evening to everybody. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you, to be able to share some of the work that has been done, taking into account the important um, cultural and historic moment that the island is living. Uh, at this time, uh, 500 years of existence is something of a record. So um, it's extremely important, extremely important moment that needs to be celebrated in more ways than one. Puerto Rico is really and truly has an amazing um, inventory um, of uh, cultural uh, properties. Uh, we have everything, honestly, I'm not exaggerating. We have uh, prehistoric uh, batallas, um, if you want a Spanish lighthouses, we have Spanish lighthouses too. We have unique architectural typologies like um, fair, fair um, uh, pavilions, uh, 19th century fair pavilions, uh, big houses, what it's called, known in the United States as big houses, uh, plantation big houses of unique, of a unique style and unique interpretation of what architecture is. We have uh, 78, not one, nor two, 78 uh, Pueblos uh, Center uh, organized around uh, a plaza and uh, with some relationship to what at the time was the most important church and the municipal representation. So this is a, really a unique inventory and a unique um, responsibility that Puerto Ricans have. But there is a jewel in the crown, and that is the old San Juan Historic District. Uh, it's not that it is far more important than on the others. On the contrary, it is on the same has the same status. But it is indeed something extremely special, not just for Puerto Ricans, uh, but for the world. Uh, this uh, city was founded. Um, uh, through experimentation of new urban and architectural ideals. And uh, this is important, as I mentioned, for the whole world. Um, when the, when the, the representative of the, of the, at the time Castilian crown uh, came to the island, he established that uh, the capital had to be moved from former Caparra 
uh, that was located in present day, the municipality of Guaynabo, and that it should be moved to the little island of uh, Caparra, it was across, across the bay. And uh, he um, very wisely described this as the best place in the world for a city. And uh, I think we have to agree with him. It's certainly a unique place. So in addition to all the architectural and urban uh, relevance and significance, uh, the geographically, it is a unique, uh, unique uh, location for a city. Old San Juan, um, it's etched in our hearts. Uh, it is the place we associate most, particularly those of us that had had to leave the island, is the place we associate with Puerto Rico. It has uh, mnemonically represents our country. Uh, it is formed uh, with of layers of history, 500 years, things that were not there originally, but uh, that now form part of the historic urban landscape that is the city. We have unique fortresses. Um, their size is truly gargantuan. Um, there's nothing like this around the globe, um, and I'm not exaggerating. And uh, it is a unique, unique uh, chapter in the history of humankind and the development of what cities ought to be and what uh, uh, urban development uh, should be. Um, every single part of that city that many of us truly love uh, is etched with unique uh, architectural and urban configurations that are symbolic of um, long lost dreams of empires from Spain and also the um, birthplace of the ethnicity that we call Puerto Rican. So it's truly a unique, unique uh, place. Um, it is, um, it, it preserves some of the, most of the uh, original uh, stone belt that protected the city. And uh, therefore it is uh, again, unique in that sense. In many places, the, the belt has been completely destroyed. It is not the case in Puerto Rico, only certain parts were destroyed. Um, emphasis on the relevance of Puerto Rico uh, started with a declaration by the Easter Puerto Rican culture uh, that uh, the old San Juan should be a historic just, it was just, at that time it was called historic zone. And uh, little by little, um, the idea gained momentum that we needed to make sure that uh, people knew how very relevant and important this city was, not just to San Juaneros or Puerto Ricans, but to the world. Um, and uh, in 1984, um, at, represented here in orange, um, we had accomplished something uh, extremely relevant and important, which is uh, that uh, what you see in orange was, were listed at the UNESCO World Heritage List. That's an honor that um, most cities in the United States don't have. And it is truly a unique honor to be represented in this, in this fashion. Some of us, including um, architect Rubio and uh, me, some of us want to see the whole city included in the UNESCO World Heritage List, but uh, that's a bit more complicated. But these efforts that uh, have been designed uh, hopefully have in the future, that would be the goal or the principal idea. Um, uh, in 1984, um, a nomination to the National Register of Historic Places. For those of you that are not too familiar, the National Register of Historic Places is kept by the National Park Service, which is a part of the US Department of the Interior and is a list of all those properties that um, are relevant to um, the United States. Um, in this particular case, uh, the nomination, as I mentioned, was four page. It was the old type of nomination and it basically covered, it's not too clear on the boundaries, but basically what I have been able to grasp is that this is more or less what was included in that nomination, 1984 nomination. As you can see, extremely relevant uh, sectors were left out. Understandably, that was the concept of historic preservation at the time, but obviously um, the La Perla uh, area has to be included, the same with La Puntilla and the port area. So um, this nomination kind of um, languished in there, but it was declared, uh, the, the, the Old San Juan Historic District was declared uh, and listed in the National Register of Historic Places, although the boundaries were not that clear. Then um, 
in uh, the year, to, uh, it, it finished in 2020, it 2012, it started um, much earlier. Um, Carlos Rubio, um, again, spearheaded the movement to revise. We were asked by the register to revise that nomination um, and to uh, make sure to have a final frontiers and also to uh, move with the times, so to speak. And this is the, the zone, uh, we now call it um, a district. This is the district that was registered uh, in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, I, I, I did the nomination. I asked for a special one special concession, and it was that uh, the nomination be listed in both Spanish and English, and it was granted by the National Register of Historic Places. Um, as you can see, and I used to, to, to use this phrase, that's why I'm quoting myself, uh, from sea to shining sea, everything in that particular area that you see in yellow was included and in the new Distrito Histórico del Viejo San Juan or uh, Historic District, San, uh, Old San Juan Historic District. This is the first page of a very, very long nomination, uh, but this is the first page and uh, it shows uh, the approval. Uh, it was accepted as such in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, this is a summary. I, um, I don't need to go into great detail, but this is a summary uh, before the nomination was created, uh, before research even started, the research lasted almost two years, uh, an inventory of every single building, object, structure, or anything was, uh, was made. That took several months, as you can imagine. And these are numbers that are needed to, to give to the National Register of Historic Places. And usually they require that you divide them into contributing and non-contributing. You don't decide that uh, on a fancy, you decide that following certain guidelines. And this was our, our find. Uh, it was uh, the National Register found that it was okay. And we have buildings, we have sites, we have structures, and we have objects within this district. Again, those qualifications are, are, are given by the National Register of Historic Places, and there are lots of definitions regarding that. So that, um, that first uh, important step was generated, and we were um, very happy to be, in a sense, uh, finished with that. Using some of the information, although the, the goal and um, the objectives are a bit different, but using that nomination a few years later, we um, were able to list the old San Juan Historic District, again, in the two languages, we were able to list it as a um, national historic landmark. Um, that this is, um, a kind of a higher level, the highest level that the United States has in terms of the historic properties. And in this particular case, we were given, um, um, it was also accepted and the area for um, there's some special uh, concepts that need to be considered had to be, it's a bit different than the other one. But again, we, we've not only listed it again in the National Register, but we were able to have it declared um, a nat National Historic Landmark. This is the, the first page of that nomination. Again, it was a very long first page, and uh, we were very happy because that uh, recognized uh, on the level of the United States the fact that this is not just another uh, historic property. This is something of a true relevance. At that time, um, um, uh, architect Rubio took a very, very innovative step and invited um, a UNESCO expert. In fact, she was working at the time for Rio de Janeiro's uh, historic uh, declaration of the UNESCO of the whole city. And uh, Mrs. Patricia McDonald is an expert in terms of the nominations to the UNESCO World Heritage List, because as I mentioned, this is the objective, this was the objective of, of Architect Rubio and myself. So to push the whole city into the UNESCO World Heritage List. And this is uh, one of her um, uh, uh, talks. She, we, we went to the field and she made some very important uh, recommendations, which hark back, uh, to 1519 and the Castilian way of interpreting the islet. Uh, the Castilian way was uh, an islet, one islet, one city. They did not perceive it as divided as it was for many centuries by the, by the 
defensive walls. It is um, the whole city, and in fact, uh, is one of the earliest maps that we have of, of the city of San Juan. And you can see that the, 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 the idea is to cover the whole islet. So um, uh, architect uh, McDonald pointed out that uh, uh, it was important, yes, the historic district, but that the three lines, Puerto Rico had five lines of defense, right? And three were in what we call Puerta de Tierra. And uh, she mentioned those have to be included in a UNESCO nomination. You cannot just have you know, the city. And that motivated the idea of um, trying to uh, list the Puerta de Tierra Historic District in the National Register of Historic Places. I made, I created that nomination that you see here. This is just one image and you can see the old San Juan Historic District and the Puerta de Tierra Historic District. So um, uh, this is the nomination. It was also accepted by uh, the National Register of Historic Places. And uh, by means of that nomination, all of the islet is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And that is um, an important, I think a very, very important step in having um, the recognition that uh, all San Juan and the islet deserve. And here are the, the concepts, uh, again, the district building sites, structures and objects according to the National Register that the uh, Puerta de Tierra um, area was included as as such. It is um, it is um, an, uh, um, uh, something of great. Uh, I feel extremely proud to have been part of this process, and uh, we even included uh, here. We even included the the, the historic the area where the historic um, puzzle between the Big Island and the Little Island was located. So um, this is something that's very important because it recognizes it's not just the island, it's the whole islet. And it may be, again, something that is preparing us for the future and for the having, having the whole city, maybe the whole islet declared, uh, listed in the UNESCO World Heritage List. So this is more or less where we are right now. Um, we we have the orange are I remind you the ones the, the areas listed in the UNESCO and so we would like to see everything in orange um, in the future. Um, one of the things that I consider this is on a personal note. One of the things that I consider extremely important about the work that the PRSHPO has been doing throughout these years is the idea of providing. Um, a somersault, a creative uh, exchange of ideas that makes sure that some of us continue uh, doing research and publish uh, important concepts uh, regarding that. This is my humble contribution. This is my birthday gift to the city where I was born. And the idea is basically some of the concepts, most of the concepts came from my, the research that I made for the nomination. So the work that the, the Puerto Rico State Historic Preservation Office, as you will see through the publications that are going to be shown today, is extremely important because it's, it's, it's somersaults, helps you somersault into the other areas that are also needed, like continued research activities, continued reinterpretation of um, this magic place uh, in order to make sure that we really understand it as best we can and that we give it the relevance uh, that it has. I, I, this is um, where my, my uh, presentation ends, but if there are any questions, uh, you can contact me via the, the school, the PRSHBO, and I'd be more than glad to answer them. Thank you. Good evening again. Today, I will provide a summary of a 29 year project whose focus was to document, to denominate, to promote the conservation of nine remnants of the Spanish fortifications built east of the historic city of San Juan, dispersed throughout the eastern part in the San Juan Islet. The second part of my presentation will address the book published by the Puerto Rico Shippo based on the fortification research. 
When the project began in 1991, little was understood or had been published about the defensive works constructed in Puerta Tierra, Puerta Tierra area under the Spanish administration. Keep in mind that because the defensive works were of a smaller scale and more recent construction than the imposing military fortifications surrounding the city of San Juan, they had been overlooked in our historiography. This meant that the search for information about these fortifications relied on multiple resources in order to piece together the historic development during the 16th to the 17th centuries, 18th centuries, and later in the 19th century. In the last century, three defensive lines were completed to protect the city's land approach and maritime access by way of the Condado Lagoon and San Antonio Channel to the San Juan Bay. In 1991, three Puerto Rico SHIPO staff, Armando Martí Carvajal, state archaeologist, staff archaeologist, Hector Abreu, conservationist, Jose Marul, state historian, studied the remnants of the fortifications to gather information on their development, evaluate their current condition, and identify the owners or public custodians of these resources. These, rem these remnants first study were the San Antonio Bridgehead Lower Battery in the corner of the bridge between San uh, Condal and Miramar Bridges. There's a segment of the San Antonio Bridgeheads that covered what the covered way today part of the site of the Paseo Caribe development. The San Jerónimo Fort at Oquerón Point, a battery at Escambrón Point, a powder house at Luis Muñoz Rivera Park, a fragment from the San Ramon Battery across the Caribe Hilton, a battery and a coastal emplacement of the defense, second defensive line, and by a Bahamar, a, cost, a coastal, sorry, a coastal observation post on the beach in the northern coast. Visits were made to local archives, like the military archives in San Cristobal Castle, the general archives of Puerto Rico, the Center of Historic Research at the University of Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rico Shippo Archives. Search in the web proved useful. In the Habs Hair Collection in the Library of Congress, the Archivo Digital Nacional, Lex Juris database, and the Spanish Archives, Paris website. Not working. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let me. Uh, okay. Sorry. In these repositories, useful information providing background information was found in publications, documents, historic maps, plans, and historic photographs. The maps from the 19 and early 20th century were crucial to understand changes in the topography in Puerto Tierra sector that included the 19th century mangrove landfills in the southern coast and another landfill in the eastern coast from the 1940s. Changes in the coast uh, in 1954, the uh, Habs drawings provided a graphic representation of the changing shoreline. We're reviewing the published material. Only two books provided significant information. Historia de la Ciudad Murada by Adolfo de Osto Ayala, published in 1948, and La Guerra en el Caribe del Siglo XVIII by Juan Manuel Zapatero López Anaya, published in 1964. The first has a chapter dealing with the military establishment in San Juan while Zapatero provides an important account of the defensive works evolution in Puerta de Tierra, including description of 12 advanced troop gun shelters placed in potential landing sites uh, in the Eastern coast. Research on the field included extensive photography of all remnants and sketch maps of the surviving lower battery of San Antonio Bridge, Bridgehead. 
The research identified four distinctive stages of development that included an initial phase of provisional batteries or forts, first of wood and later of stone, on the Balcadon and San Antonio ports to control land access and maritime access. A second phase was linked to the military reforms undertaken in San Juan from 1765 to 1790. A third phase was a result of the 1797 British siege of, the San, uh, of San Juan and involved the construction of parapets, new batteries, and three defensive lines in Puerta de Tierra. A fourth and final phase describes the break of breakup and demolition, demolition of defensive lines systems by institutional development projects during the first decades of the 20th century. Once the survey stage was completed in 1996, we worked with the National Park Service Southeast Regional Office to prepare a national register, registration form for the advanced line that would integrate national significance. To be sure, this nomination posed interesting challenges because the remnants dispersal, the deteriorated conditions, and the presence of new development. The advanced lines nomination included four contributing resources, the redoubt of San Jeronimo Fort, remnants of the bridgehead of San Antonio, the battery Escambron, and the San Jeronimo powder house. The discontinued district was listed on the National Register on September 25th, 1997. After the district's inclusion in 2012, the Puerto Rico SHPO received a donation of thousands of documents digitized from the Spanish archives that included construction projects carried out in the 19th century. As part of this donation, 336 maps and plans from the Archivo General Militar de Madrid and the Archivo Cartográfico y Estudio Geográfico del Ejército contain vital information that made possible to fill in information gaps that, left, that were left from the initial research concerning the development of the advanced lines. Five years later, in 2017, the Puerto Rico sponsored the publication of the advanced lines in Puerta de Tierra as part of the commemorative activities regarding the 500 years of the foundation of the San Juan de Puerto Rico. The book project started early in 2018. The publication, Protegiendo la Capital, Desarrollo Histórico de las Obras Defensivas en Puerta de Tierra was organized in four chapters. The first chapter, Puente del Agua y el Canal de San Antonio, described defensive concerns in the Eastern sector after, found, after the founding of the city of San Juan. It describes the first batteries and forts that were built to protect the deep, against debarkation by land forces from European hostile nations, English, Dutch, and French, in Eastern beaches of the islet, and also to protect the bridge Puente del Agua, which was the only crossing to the mainland. These defensive works saw action during the two English assaults in 1595 by Sir Francis Drake and in 1598 by Sir George Clifford, Earl of Cumberland, and a Dutch attack in 1625 from Hendricks from the each, Dutch, each, Dutch East Company. Sorry. In this chapter, I chose to include a close-up of a 1599 English engraving from the British Museum commemorating the capture of San Juan by the Earl of Cumberland. This engraving provided graphic representation of the city of San Juan. The, assault, the English assault operations and the Spanish positions in the eastern sector of the San Juan Islet. The 16th 25 Dutch attack, which ended with the burning of the city of San Juan, spurred construction of the first wall and bastions enclosing the city and the fortifications with permanent material stone on the eastern coast. The second chapter, Ingenieros Militares Miran a la Campaña, 
describe the efforts of the Spanish military engineers to improve the fortifications, creating 12 troop shelters for shelter field battery positions and reforming the bridgehead of San Antonio and Fort San Jeronimo, constructing a powder house and working with the midway defense line. This system was tested, tested during the British attack in 1797, commanded by the General Sir Ralph Abercrombie. This chapter documents the presence of a ground depression, which the Spanish military engineers converted to a large defensive trench named Trincheron. Between 1797 and 1783, in 19th century maps, the Trincheron was identified as the third defensive line. Also worthy of note was a 1788 plan for the renovated San Antonio bridgehead, which would separate, which, but sorry, which would replace the existing that damaged structure uh, from uh, damage from an earthquake the previous year. The chapter ends with a painting of Ramon de Castro, governor and captain general of Puerto Rico, which in close-up shows two forts and the position of the Spanish troops in Puerta Tierra during the 1797 siege of San Juan. The third chapter, Las Líneas Avanzadas de Puerta de Tierra, discusses the reforms of fortifications in Puerta de Tierra implemented in the 19th century by the military engineers after the 1797 siege that led to the construction of the three defense, line, defense lines. Two first maps of the 19th century, one from 1801 and another from 1833, were used to mark the construction progress of the advanced defense lines. In the last quarter of the 19th century, new technological developments of the second industrial revolution generated changes in ammunition, armament, and the use of steam powered dreadnoughts, all of which ushered the end of the era of bastion fortifications. These changes meant the construction of sunken concrete reinforced batteries and with rearming with breech loading artillery in the military plaza of San Juan. The chapter is enriched by 10 graphic recreations from Eric Perez Gomez, a Puerto Rican illustrator from the group San Juan Blanco y Negro. The fourth chapter in Sanchez de la Ciudad de San Juan explains the changes that occurred in Puerta de Tierra sector during the last decades of the 19th century until the beginning of the 21st century. This chapter starts with a description of San Juan municipality efforts to get approval for the city's expansion. With the demolition in 1897 of the fortifications in the southeastern end land front, the defenses in the eastern sectors were improved. When, the Puerto, Rico, when Puerto Rico was ceded to the United States after the Spanish American War of 1898, most lands of the first and second defensive lines became part of the San Jeronimo Naval Reservation. This chapter mentions, this chapter mentions the curious case of the retired commander, Virgil Baker, who obtained from the Department of the Navy a 999 year lease of the lands of San Jeronimo Reservation. As the 20th century progressed, the Spanish fortifications in Puerto de Tierra were gradually lost due to the changes in land use, dynamic and destructive urban development that fragmented the defensive lines. This, this last chapter deals with, this last past chapter deals with preservation efforts of, the, of Puerto Rico and federal agencies to document stabilize, restore the remnants of defensive lines. In chapter, this chapter has 58 photographs, 10 maps, and one postcard to complement narrative. In December 22nd, 
2020, Dr. Aníbal Sepúlveda Rivera, planner and member of the Puerto Rico Academy of History, made a virtual presentation on the, on the book. Dr. And Dr. Sepúlveda has made substantial contributions through publications on urban history of the city of San Juan and the traditional urban cores in Puerto Rico. Dr. Sepúlveda presentation can be viewed in the Puerto Rico History Preservation Office Facebook page. Due to the high demand of this publication, the printed version of the book is currently unavailable. However, this publication can be seen digitally at isu.com. I have concluded my presentation and would like to welcome Dr. Lila Lara Fonseca, Puerto Chippewa Coordinator, who will be speaking about the publication La Ciudad en el Tiempo, Cinco Siglos de Representaciones Artísticas, and of the exhibition at the Museum of San Juan based on, on this book. Thank you. La ciudad en el tiempo, cinco siglos de representaciones artísticas de San Juan, published in 2020, narrates through images and documents the urban, social, and cultural development of the sectors that make of San Juan Islet. The publication driven by architect Carlos Arrubio Cancela turned out to be one of the most ambitious academic projects, projects that I had the privilege to produce. As coordinator and specialist, I was involved in the first phase of the project, generating an inventory of more than 500, 500 works of art of San Juan that include maps, drawings, paintings, engravings, and posters that belong to the permanent, collect permanent collections of local museums. I also had the opportunity to identify the specialists who wrote the content, content of the book and work hand by hand with them to complete the project in adverse times. The publication has an introduction four chapters and a catalog with representations organized in nine teams. This publication had the collaboration of five extraordinary art historians that wrote the content of the book and at the same time proposed representations that should be included in their essays, which belong to permanent collections on international museums and archives. The specialists were Dr. Liz, Dr. Lisette Cabrera Salcedo, Dr. Ingrid Jimenez Martinez, Architect Hector Balvanera Alfaro, Dr. Daniel Exposito Sanchez, and Dr. Jimenez eh, Maria del Burdes Javier. The book was diagrammed and by graphic designer Orlando Clavel and had the expertise of renowned photographer John Betancourt. In the introduction of the book, Dr. Lisette Cabrera defines the scenery of San Juan since 1520 as the cradle of military administration and evangelization during the Spanish conquest and colonization of Puerto Rico. Its bastions, walls, chapels, and squares were slowly shaping the spirit and physiognomy of what today we identify as the oldest historical and sociocultural center of Puerto Rico. Cabrera Salcedo reiterates that it is in the urban center of San Juan where the first ideas to educate, raise, and spread awareness of being Puerto Rican emerged through artistic communication. 
It is the context where Jose Campeche Jordan, one of our most emblematic painters flourished and began to delineate the rich trajectory of his world city as a place of inspiration in in situ, an in situ museum for humanity until the sun of today. Cravarela Salcedo stands out that the first former classes, drawing classes in the Islet were given in the 1820s, organized by the Royal Economic Society of Friends of the Country. That institution was among the first to commission the creation of artwork featuring outstanding figures of Puerto from Puerto Rican history while promoting painting exhibitions. After the disappearance of the society around 1898, its art artworks would go to the collection of the Puerto Rican Ateneum, founded in 1876 in the History Center of San Juan. These are just some of the entities that emerged in the historic area and multiply as the 20th century progress up to the present day. The introduction is fundamental to point out San Juan as an extraordinary reference that not only inspired artistic representations of its emblematic buildings, streets, and interior spaces, but also served as a space for instruction about art and aesthetics justifying the vast productions that were generated in the city by local and foreign artists along 500 years that can be revised by the careful selection of works of art included in this publication. In the first chapter of the book, The City of San Juan in Images, 16th and 17th century, Dr. Ingrid Jimenez Martinez established the San Juan site as one that has inspired its representations since its foundation. In Martinez's words, the military, religious, and civil architecture, as well as the urban layout, oriented the grid of Roman imprint, were represented in beautiful maps, watercolors, greens, and paintings from the 16th and 17th century. And it can be appreciated in the first chapter of the book as a reliable testimony of, of San Juan, the city through time. The artworks from 16th and 17th century include pieces mainly of Dutch illustrators and cartographers, and, uh, and, to, and cartographers like Johannes Binswood, Johan Slot, and Arnaldos Montanus, and two paintings of, paintings of Spanish artists Eugenio Cajes and Francisco de Surbara. The representations show the city of San Juan's place, territory, and landscape, defined, defended by some and sieged by others as the most important Spanish enclave in the island. Maps and prints show that which was treasured in the city from the description of an inventory of what's seen by those who, don't, who do not live on the city. And on the other hand, paintings that narrate the victories of the Spanish crown against its enemies. At the end of her essay, Dr. Jimenez, Dr. Jimenez opens the door to the content of next chapters by establishing the differences between the representations of these foreigners and the artworks generated by local artists, those who live the city, those who live in the city and consider it their home, identified by their prolific productions from the 18th century until today. In the second chapter of the book, there is a regal city space and image, San Juan in the works of Jose Campeche, 18th century. Architect Hector Balvanera reflects on the architecture and urban settings of San Juan during the 18th century, having as reference the works of Jose Campeche Jordan. Balvanera, Balvanera proposed that the mulatto artist, designer, and musician, supporter and head of the family workshop, member of the Third Order of St. Dominic and the Fixed Garrison Regiment related to the main social groups within the city. 
is the first citizen who captured them on his canvas. San Juan was the capital of the military stronghold of Puerto Rico, a geostrategic key to the Spanish empire dependent on the viceroyalty of New Spain. Its civil and institutional architecture lag behind the defensive works completed by Alejandro Rally, Tomas Odali, and Francisco Mestre. In Barbanera's own words, the urban iconography shows its presence in the portraits of the fixed garrison regiment and Governor Ramon de Castro, and also the emblematic painting of Miguel Antonio Dustariz where the artist expresses the idealization of urban development. In ex voto of the English siege of 1797, which received a profound analysis of the specialist, Balvanera decomposes the urban representation, complements and deepens the understanding of the complex allegorical sense of the city, its order, configuration and meaning reflecting centuries old heritage of Western classical and Christian tradition. In the chapter three of the book, For Ambitious Visions of San Juan, Dr. Daniel Exposito Sanchez proposed four visions to understand the historical city. Through a series of drawings, engravings, and paintings made by foreign travelers, who visited or stayed in the capital between 1821 and 1936. In the first vision, Exposito highlights, highlights what is built and developed in the city through little known drawings emblem of emblematic buildings by French naturalist Augusto Blais. Another piece dissected by the specialist is the personification of Captain General Miguel de la Torre by American artist Elia Metcalf, as he was portrayed accompanied by impressive representations of the city's built heritage, reiterating the Spanish power on the island. Exposito also considered, considered travelers who represented a more intimate view as a new vision of the city, specifically the nightlife in San Juan, characterized by private parties was described and illustrated by a set of watercolors and drawings, drawings identified in a manuscript, Impresiones de un viaje a América by the Spanish writer, Jose Maria Gutierrez de Alba. In the last vision, Exposito discusses the transition to the 20th century, where artists such as Spanish Fernando Diaz Maqueno and Alejandro Sanchez Felipe had their workshops in different parts of the historical city and impacted a generation of students that later became recognized artists. Exposito established that an important contribution of these artists lies in the creation of an iconography of San Juan, one that captures the essence of the old colonial city and serves as the foundation for the construction of an image that even today continues to characterize the spirit of the capital. In chapter two, in chapter four of the book, brief notes on the representation of all San Juan by 20th century Puerto Rican artists, Dr. Dr. Maria de Lourdes Javier reflects on how 20th century local artists view San Juan and its historic city as a symbol of identity and cultural resistance from foreign influences. In the first decades, the displacements of rural workers into the city is reflected on San Juan's paintings as poverty stands out in one emblematic representations. After 1950, San Juan became the backdrop for social criticism, showing the harsh realities beyond the tourist camera lenses. As stated by Javier, it is during this century that local artists also highlight the beauty of all San Juan. These works show colonial structures and monuments that inher inherently remind us of its history. Lastly, Javier highlights the artists that work within the inhabited city. These are works that show the city 
as it was lived. They are identity, identity affirmations in which the history past of the city is part of everyday life. The thematic catalog of the book was conceptualized and written by Doctora Cabrera Salcedo and was organized on nine themes with the collaboration of architect Rubio Cancela and this server. Dr. Cabrera Salcedo included in this section works of art that belong to private collection, local collections. The catalog has more than 100 works of art that reflect on themes that recurrently are considered in the visual culture that defines the capital's historical complex. The organization of the pieces in every theme serve, as I say, as graphic essay, es, essays about Puerta de Tierra, Calle San Sebastián Street, La Perla, other streets, facades, squares, and ornaments, emblematic buildings, characters in the city, historical events, cultural activities. And at the end of the publication, there's a section of drawings of San Juan generated by young artists that are students at the League of Art Students guided by Professor Marilyn Torres that we denominated the city as an educational setting. La Ciudad en el Tiempo was written in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. For this reason, we recognize the renowned group of art historians who committed to reflecting on and writing five precious texts about the aesthetics, social and cultural values of more than 200 works in context ranging chronologically from the 16th to the 21st century. Once the project was completed, the publication turned out to be an extraordinary contribution to the study of the city, using as the main reference pieces of more than 50 visual artists among both Puerto Ricans and over 20 foreigners who represented the islet throughout these past five centuries. The book contains representations of the following local artists. Jose Alicea, Alfonso Arana, Mirna Baez, René Benvenuti, Isabel Bernal, Julio C. Viaggi, Janete Soto, Julio Díaz Santos, Daphne Elvira, Jorge García Jiménez, Consuelo Botay, David Goitia, Lorenzo Omar, Wilfred Laviosa, Samuel Lin, Antonio Maldonado, Carlos Marichal, Antonio Martorell, Maria, Maria de Mater O'Neill, Roberto Matos González, Anelis Molin, Rubén Moreira, Luis Muñoz Lee, Ana Nicholson, Luis Abraham Ortiz, Enoch Pérez, José Oliver, Nick Quijano, Denis Mario Rivera, Rafael Rivera Rosa, Arnaldo Roche y Rabel, José Rosa, Félix Rodríguez Báez, Julio Rosado del Valle, Nelson Zambolín, Carmelo Sobrino, José A. Torres Martino, Roberto Torzola, Rafael Treyes, Rafael Tufiño y N. Arturo Von Hart. The book was dedicated to Dr. Ricardo Alegría Gallardo in the midst of celebrating 100 years of his birth as a recognition for his efforts as head of the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture from 1955 to 1973 to preserve the city of San Juan in a moment where the integrity of its historic fabric was at risk of disappearing. The director of the Museum of San Juan, Luis Moises Perez, recognized the relevance of the book as essential for future research 
and understood that the curatorial effort specified in it should be the reference for a commemorative art exhibition of the historical city. At the same time, PR Shibo, State Historic Preservation Officer, acknowledged the importance of this publication effort going beyond an impressed version. And that's, that's why he encouraged the sponsorship of a temporary exhibition in the San Juan Museum. The museum montage was based on a selection of artworks prominent in the book and will follow the chronological script of the publication. The text on the panels of the exhibit had the titles of each chapter of the book and a summary of the content addressed by the five specialists with some of the pieces analyzed on each section. The exhibit has 31 works of art that not only correspond to renowned artists who consequently represented scenes of San Juan, but also to other artists who have done the same occasionally. The pages of the book, La Ciudad en el Tiempo, now illustrate the panels of the emblematic museum of the capital, provoking a significant reading about the city from the city. We expect that the journey to the gallery will allow its visitors to open windows to new per perspectives on the rich history that is not collected, that is not only collected on the surface of two treasure sectors, all San Juan and Porta de Tierra, but also from the intimacy of the interior spaces of architecture, its characters and the events that mark its evolution in time. The exhibition opened to the public on September 15, 2021, and for the moment, will be at Oyer Gallery till March 2022. Without further ado, I give the word to Dr. Silvia Alvarez Curbelo, who will talk about Patrimonio Volume 10. Thank you. Muy buenas noches, agradecida eh, de la recepción y de la acogida del de Centro de Estudios puertorriqueños a este eh, conjunto de actividades eh, que han destacado eh, los que me han precedido, eh, auspiciado por la Oficina de Conservación Histórica de Puerto Rico. Eh, me toca a mí, eh, digamos, finalizar esta presentación eh, con una presentación, la presentación de la revista Patrimonio número 10, es eh, parte de la serie de eh, números que ha publicado eh, la Oficina de Preservación Histórica, cada uno de ellos maravilloso, eh, muy bien concebidos y ejecutados, espero que Patrimonio 10 eh, haga honra de esta tradición. Patrimonio 10 está dedicado a los 500 años de la Fundación de San Juan de Puerto Rico en la Isleta, es lo que nos convoca hoy en esta presentación. Eh, agradezco profundamente a la Oficina de Preservación Histórica que me haya invitado a ser, eh, digamos, la coordinadora de esto, y esta edición me ha llenado de mucho orgullo, eh, sobre todo porque he compartido con excelentes eh, historiadores, artistas, eh, diseñadores gráficos, eh, para su consecución. Este número, pat eh, Patrimonio Número 10, eh, contiene un monográfico sobre la fundación de San Juan en la Isleta. Ya hemos visto en varias de las presentaciones 
esta representación, eh, un fragmento aquí de un mapa de Rodrigo de Figueroa, en el que se inscribe la leyenda, aquí ha de ser la ciudad. La Fundación de San Juan nunca acaba, es una onda eh, memoriosa, eh, sedimentada, pero también incierta, abierta. Y los ensayos que componen este monográfico son asimismo viajes, viajes de ida y vuelta a una ciudad que es y no es la misma. Eh, buscar una esencia permanente y mutable de San Juan eh, es tarea fútil, es una recreación constante, es una refundación constante. El número de, antes de eso, eh, este número eh, fue dedicado a, hoy dedicado, al doctor Luis González Vález, historiador oficial de Puerto Rico de 1992 a 2018, eh, ha sido también director de la Academia Puertorriqueña de la Historia, de la cual formo eh, parte, y ha tenido innumerables eh, ejecutorias, responsabilidades, que ha cumplido con una dedicación, con una responsabilidad increíble. Y eh, de un artículo que produjo eh, la crítica cultural Carmen, eh, ay Dios mío, se me, se me ha ido Carmen Hernández, eh, nos dice lo siguiente, cual centinela en la guerra del tiempo, González Vales ha velado desde las instituciones públicas y privadas en las que ha ejercido por acrecentar el patrimonio documental y material puertorriqueño. En eh, esta dedicatoria, eh, José Rigao ha contribuido con una eh, semblanza eh, a la que yo, en la que yo también eh, colaboré. Vaya nuestro saludo al historiador Luis González Vález. El primero de los eh, artículos, de los ensayos que incluye este eh, número conmemorativo es de la autoría de Manuel Valdés Piscini, un eh, antropólogo social eh, que laboró durante mucho tiempo y todavía sigue colaborando con la Universidad de Puerto Rico en Mayagüez. Eh, se titula esa colaboración de eh, Valdés Piscini, El estuario y sus humedales cronotopo líquido y fundacional de la ciudad murada. Eh, Valdés Piscini eh, se, se vincula a un historiador, eh, un gran historiador mundial, eh, Fernán Braudel, eh, autor de un excelente libro sobre el Mediterráneo, para eh, describir ese estuario que sigue siendo una envoltura, una protección, un lugar incluso de resistencia, ¿verdad? que acompaña a la ciudad de San Juan. Y bajo, esa, eh, bajo la tutela de esa estupenda, eh, dramática eh, pintura de Mirna Báez, titulada Mangle, hace una historia, una descripción animada, porque uno siente estar entre esas marismas, entre esos esteros, entre ese mangle, eh, que es el estuario de San Juan con Manuel Valdés Piscini. Eh, hay una cita de él que me gusta mucho. En torno al teje meneje de las metrópolis, eh, in, eh, que influye y subyace una historia social de ríos, pantanos, manglares, agricultores, pescadores, negros y marrones, mul, eh, mulatos, bestias, gávaros, boteros y esclavos refrescados por, por el agua aloja, trabaja, este trabajo navega y reflexiona sobre todas las dimensiones del estuario y su importancia, cronotopo lípido y líquido, eh, tiempo y espacio combinados y vital en un proceso fundacional de larga duración. El segundo de los ensayos se titula La sombra alargada del, largo, del arco de Cápara, sí, con acento en la A. Aníbal Sepúlveda el Rivera le sigue el rastro a Juan Ponce de León y a la sombra alargada del arco de Cáparra, 
que le acompaña en las ciudades que funda el español en Puerto Rico. Eh, Cáparra, pues, que queda en el Camino de la Plata y que seguramente Ponce de Lón, eh, conoció eh, y, igualmente, ¿verdad? Eh, eh, acompaña, según el ensayo, que es un ensayo interesantísimo, eh, a Juan Ponce de León en esas ciudades que fundó la española, dos en la española y una en Puerto Rico, Capa, eh, Caparra, pero de don, donde nunca permanece. Aquel arco, el de España, dedicado a Jano, dios de pasados y futuros, le dictó a Ponce de León un destino inquieto. San Juan se funda, como ustedes saben, en la isleta, sin su anuencia. A Juárez Coloniales, indicadores de la cotidianidad en Puerto Rico en la década de 1510, es la colaboración que hace Paola Chapacase eh, con objetos de vida y trabajo que aparecen en las listas de mercancías traídas a la isleta, eh, que ella ha recuperado en los archivos y en desentierros arqueológicos. Son signos estos objetos de los gustos de la época y de los saberes artesanales de las tierras dejadas atrás. Pero mediante ajustes y adaptaciones tropicales se asientan los rituales cotidianos, entre fogones, costura y herrajes, en los primeros tiempos de San Juan, que lucha contra el salitre y las inevitables plagas. Es interesante ver en estos objetos, fragmentos, eh, cosas rotas, eh, cristales eh, destruidos por el tiempo o, se, o que pensábamos destruidos por el tiempo ver las indicaciones de una vida cotidiana que se va configurando en esa isleta la isleta donde dicen que ha de mudar el pueblo en 1521 una ciudad emerge en un promontorio vacío objeto del deseo de los colonizadores en Caparra Andy Rivera espía a los vecinos cuando marcan la cuadrícula imperfecta de San Juan y se erigen las primeras estructuras por esclavos e indígenas sometidos. Con alquimia tecnológica, Andy genera con fidelidad documental imágenes digitales ¿sí? que replican la fundación en una topografía de suaves ondulaciones e imponentes farallones es una de las contribuciones eh, excelsas de, esta, de este número de patrimonio, eh, ver estas creaciones digitales de Andy, eh, director de Puerto Rico Historical Buildings Drawing Society, esta entidad que nos recrea eh, como pues, un alquimista eh, medieval, esta ciudad de San Juan, eh, naciendo, en 1521, en la isleta. Cavilaciones sobre lo que está, pero no, la iglesia de San José en San Juan de Puerto Rico. Tras muchos años de recorrerla con la mirada, con el tacto, con la imaginación, en sueño y en vela, su arquitecto restaurador, Jorge Rigao Pérez, ve en la iglesia de San José, segunda de América, un microcosmo de la conquista temprana, con sus terrores, devociones, esperanzas y pesadillas. Encendido el incienso, se alumbran las opciones estéticas, ahí tienen una de ellas, y de construcción. Un proceso de 20 años, como dice el tardo, 20 años no es nada. 20 años que le deja tantas preguntas a Jorge como respuestas. Muchas de ellas están en este ensayo. En mi viejo San Juan, un palincesto caribeño de memorias y deseos. Para Francisco Rodríguez Suárez, eh, decano de la Escuela de Arquitectura de la Universidad de Illinois y actualmente, fue decano de la Facultad de, de la Escuela de Arquitectura de la Universidad de Puerto Rico. Para él, entre las ciudades fundacionales del Caribe, desde San Juan a Panamá, hay lazos de familia. 
capturados por la arquitectura, la literatura y la experiencia urbana. Ahí ven ustedes uno de ellos, Manuel Hernández Acevedo, eh, la calle San Sebastián en 1964, estupenda. Sede ordenadora de poderes políticos y religiosos, la ciudad caribeña no deja de ser tumultuaria. Lo mismo para una fiesta que para una protesta, para despenetrar gobiernos como para crear comunidad de vecinos y vecinas, San Juan se pinta sola. Finalmente, escrito en las esquinas de las calles, 500 años de memoria San Juaneras. Personajes conocidos y por conocer, nace, narran sus vivencias en la ciudad capital en la que vivieron o pernoctaron por un tiempo durante algún momento de los siglos, cinco siglos de existencia de esta urbe. Le exigen a Magali García Ramos que les ayude a encontrar algo que han perdido. Un fragmento de vajilla, una losa de un hogar, la puntilla de un vestido, el frasco de cristal francés, porque aducen que no tendrán paz ni dejarán tranquilos a los que ahora la habitan hasta no cerrar el capítulo de sus vidas que han decidido contarnos de calle en calle. Con este elenco, ¿sí? espero que se sientan estimulados a leer Patrimonio número 10, una historia de fundaciones, refundaciones, revisitaciones, ¿sí? recreaciones digitales, fantasmas urbanos, ¿sí? mangles, el espíritu de Juan Ponce de León llegando y huyendo como Jano entre pasados y futuros, ¿sí? entre dosas viejas y listas de mercancía. Muchísimas gracias por eh, estar con nosotros. Esperemos que eh, este número le haga verdadera honra a la ciudad de San Juan en sus 500 años, una recreación digital de Andy Rivera y una fotografía aérea de él mismo. 500 años de patrimonio. Muchas gracias. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias a todos. Eh, maravillosa la información que se ha compartido en la noche de hoy. Eh, muchas gracias a nuestros panelistas, eh, doctora Arlín Pavón, eh, José Marul, Silvia Álvarez Cubero y Lilia Lara Fonseca. Eh, dado la limitación de tiempo, no vamos a poder tener la sección de preguntas y respuestas. Eh, porque la, los traductores ya se nos tuvieron que ir, eh, gracias a las personas de lenguaje de señas que eh, siguen aquí todavía. Invitamos a, al público que asistió a que contacte los panelistas o contacte la Oficina de Preservación Histórica Estatal. Eh, si tienen alguna pregunta, si quieren adquirir alguno de los libros, si quieren eh, adquirir el, el nuevo número de patrimonio, eh, y nada, eh, los esperamos la semana que viene con el doctor Aníbal Sepúlveda y con Moncho López, que van a estar hablando sobre la tercera fundación de San Juan eh, el próximo martes a esta misma hora por el mismo canal. Así que los vemos eh, entonces. Muy buenas noches a todos y a todas. Hasta luego y feliz acción de gracias. <música>